Ed. Everyone's taking their appropriate medications? Fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this meeting is called to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Present. 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 Okay. Public comment. Public comment is limited to items not on the agenda. The commission may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed by the Brown Act, Government Code Section 54954.2. However, the Commission's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future Commission agenda for a more comprehensive action or report. Is there anyone here that wanted to address anything that is not on the agenda? No, seeing no one, then we will move on to the approval of the minutes for December 5th. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Public hearing. Procedure for public hearing. Staff will present a report on the history, physical features, etc. on the application, followed with the staff's recommendations. The applicant will make a presentation. Thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had an opportunity to be heard, the <coughs> hearing will be closed and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The Commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to raising only those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice. The public notice or in written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Speakers should fill out a speaker's form found by the door and hand it to the recording secretary prior to addressing the commission. The speaker should come up to the microphone to speak since the meeting is being recorded. This will assist staff in preparing the minutes. At this point, I, we have not received any speakers' forms, so if anyone here is interested in speaking, if they would please pick up one of the forms and fill it out and hand it to one of us, please. Okay, the first item for discussion, uh, first item on the agenda is 612 El Camino Real, APN 050-133090. Request for approval of a conditional use permit and architectural review for an outdoor use in the C-S Highway Commercial District subject to the ER district overlay. And apparently staff will be recommending a continuance to January 25th, 2012, or the commission will be recommending. Uh, thank you. Staff does not have anything to add. Uh, just that the I applicant is requesting that this item be continued to the January 25th meeting. And I uh, just wanted to note for the public that is a Wednesday night, so it's a special meeting date. Um, and as you recall, previously you opened the public hearing and continued it. So if you would like to, again, open the public hearing, see if there's any comments, and then continue it to the date specific of January 25th. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone here who wanted to speak about that? So we were, for uh, 612 El Camino Real, was there anyone here who wanted to speak regarding that project? No? Okay. Um, then we're, we will be keeping the meeting open. I had um, one, one request of, of staff, if it was possible to get some additional information for that meeting. Um, I was interested in seeing what in writing the um, fire department or whoever provides that kind of safety information for projects like this, what specifically was included in their, their report. Okay. Thank you. Did, any comment or questions? None. From commissioners? No. Okay. Um, would someone like to make a motion for the continuance? Yes. I move to continue um, the APN 050-133-090-612 El Camino Real request for approval of a conditional use permit to, to be continued to January 25th, 2012, and to leave the public hearing, hearing open. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Okay, item B, 1681-1697 Industrial Road, 
APN 046-240-040, consideration of an appeal of a zoning administrator approval to modify an existing conditional use permit. Staff report, please. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Gavin Monahan, and I will be taking you uh, through the aspects of uh, an appeal that was filed against a zoning administrator approval to modify an existing conditional use permit uh, for the businesses at 1681 through 1697 Industrial Road, also known as Dominico's Winery. Um, so starting from the beginning here for tonight's meeting, the appeal was submitted by Russ and Debbie Margiotta. Margiotta, they're the owners of a neighboring structure at 1661 Industrial Road. This is the building, or we'll get to the maps later, that, that's between um, Industrial Road and the freeway closest to the US 101 side um, as you're looking at the site map. <coughs> um, I'm gonna go a little bit back into some history. This project first came in front of you in 2004 as a conditional use permit with a, um, a request for a variety of uses that were inside of this structure. It's located there with the red arrow. At that point, um, a variety of entitlements were granted by the Planning Commission. Um, and since that time, there has been some additional entitlements that were granted by staff uh, that were found to be non-significant uh, changes. Those are were, those were granted a couple years later um, for entitlements. So between 2004 and now, the, the venue is operated with a consortium of types of uses related to wine, wine making, wine storage. They also had entitlements for a deli, um, and they do do some sublet space. These are all uh, things that are were allowed under the use permit for PM2, um, or were allowed outright. There are several of those types of things that are allowed outright in the plan manufacturing uh, zoning district. It's now GCI. I just put that up there just for reference because we're in the process of changing over. So. The applications in front of you tonight are being reviewed under the old zoning, so you'll see that, but I think it's nice to start talking a little bit about the new zoning and how that affects uh, some of our decisions going forward. The general plan remains the same because it's two years old and we're still under that and it's planned industrial. The existing land uses around there or for this particular building is a multi-use. It has storage, wine making, uh, special events. There is the entitlement for a deli, a catering kitchen. Um, and then sublet space for, uh, the, for excess interior uh, areas that the, the property owners have. And the surrounding uses are industrial. Uh, at some point in the last couple of years, there had been a complaint uh, that was uh, aired to staff regarding parking impacts and how they affect neighboring businesses. There had also been a complaint uh, that had been uh, shared with the planning staff or with the city that there possibly was illegal dumping on the site. Uh, that is something that, that turned out not to be the case. We sent out County Health. Uh, they're in charge of looking for illegal dumping and the, things of that nature, and they determined that there was no, there was no violation. They're very strict with NPDES as far as discharges into uh, creeks and waterways, ultimately into the bay, and there was no citation given and no um, problems found. So what happened was uh, uh, an anonymous complaint came in, and that got staff uh, chatting with the property owner about their parking arrangements and the types of uses they were doing. They had an entitlement to operate a winery, uh, delicatessen, wine tasting room, wine storage, and special events. Under the original conditional use permit, the special events, the idea was that they'd be limited to a certain amount per month. And specific to that, uh, when prior to an event being held, the owners of Domenico's uh, would notify staff, let them know that there was gonna be a special event. Uh, I think with the idea that we could address parking it's not that practicable, practicable. It's not that practical either to address uh, parking on a one-by-one -one basis. We'd much rather see our conditional use permits and our businesses have the amount of on-site parking that's required for the type of business that they're being entitled for or to have shared parking agreements or other parking arrangements through either a reduction in parking requirement, a shared parking agreement, or some other such thing. Uh, and this, in this case, they did. They had a shared parking agreement with uh, the Circle Star Center um, but it, since that time it had expired, there's been a change of ownership at Circle Star, and it was really time to look at their use permit basically for parking. That's what we were evaluating it for at the time, how to, um, to take care of parking impacts that might be, uh, impact, parking uh, overflow that might be impacting the neighbors and causing problems for neighboring businesses. And we typically do that when there's a limited amount of parking on space through a shared parking agreement. 
So it was the planning manager's decision to have the zoning administrator look at it basically from the shared parking agreement standpoint to review the new two new shared parking formal shared parking agreements that were put in place that would allow the Dominico's winery to operate their special events. So there's three parking tables in here, and we'll get to them later, but basically as a standalone business for wine storage, wine manufacturing, wine club, uh, the deli, wine tasting, and those types of things, they have plenty of on-site parking. They're overparked. So those types of uses can happen uh, on an ongoing basis without any restrictions to time or, um, or activity because there's plenty of on-site parking. Once you have a special event, those tend to draw a lot more people. In this case, they were approved, I believe, up to 250 people. Uh, originally 175 and then it was increased to 250 and that of course creates a larger parking demand so that is what the shared parking agreements address and we can go over those more formally uh, when we get to that section I just want to give a little bit of background on the site because I think it makes sense while we have the screen up here and and provide a little bit of history please stop me at any point because it's this project's been going on for for six or seven years so if there's something I, you would like me to clarify in the, in the historical section I'd be happy to do so I have it all in my head right now, which is current, and sometimes I forget to mention things that happened in the past. So, um, The appeal, so what happened was in uh, the summer of 2011, we took this hearing to the zoning administrator for the, for the uh, parking, uh, shared parking agreements, um, and uh, one of the property owners uh, was present at the meeting and uh, had comments about concerns with things like the waste handling at the site for when there's a grape crush. Uh, parking overflow, parking spillage into the possibly onto private property or causing parking impacts. Um, the events themselves, just the fact that there were large events held at the venue. Um, storage and disposal of waste, parking impacts. Uh, and there were a few other things mentioned too, like potential for there to be uh, problems with county health or with illegal discharges or things of that nature. Um, subsequent to that, we've had conversations with county health. There are no reported issues with uh, the county health department. There's no violations on record. Um, and nothing in their file that shows that there's ever been a problem with um, health impacts or health uh, regulations at the facility. Um, and then the same for the illegal dumping that I discussed a little bit earlier. So this is what the appeal states. Um, and then the appeal goes into three specific details that I, I included in the staff report and then did a follow-up just after them. And they include the bottling trailer, um, the appeal references city codes in the plan manufacturing district that require all uses to be conducted in an entirely enclosed building or structure is really what it says. The appellants assert that the bottling trailer is a vehicle and lacks the attributes to be considered an enclosed structure. So previous to this, we had met with the applicants, Domenico's Winery, had a discussion about their bottling trailer. It's stored on the side of the building. It looks like it's on a street side, but it's actually a private alley. It's not unlike East San Carlos Avenue, if you're familiar with the businesses that are along that. It looks like a city street in some ways, but it's really a private, private property in an alley that serves the entrances to several businesses. The bottling trailer as it stands now faces that. And there were concerns that it wasn't attractive. There was aesthetic issues that there was manufacturing going outside, which includes cooking up hoses to it. It's where they do the bottling uh, on an infrequent basis. Um, and that there's comings and goings, which are things that we'd expect in that zoning district. But um, it's on the side of the building. So it probably looks like it's happening in the front yard because that's where the parking is. So it's one of those buildings that's, that's skewed. Um, and so the, one of the uh, concerns with the appeal is that this, is, this activity, this outdoor manufacturing is not happening inside of a structure, but instead it's in a trailer. Planning staff looked at that and said, well, it's an infrequent use, um, and the trailer, trailer is designed to bottle, which is something that we have very little of in San Carlos, bottle wine. We looked at it as a one-on-one as -on -one situation and um, recommended that the bottling trailer be moved to the back of the property and be screened, because it was our understanding at first that it was an impact with aesthetics and the fact that it was on the side alley, that it was a nuisance for other businesses, and that moving it into the back of their property on 100% privately owned land Fencing it with a fence to the height that's um, allowed in the PM2 district um, would benefit the surrounding property owners by potentially lessening its aesthetic impacts or uh, noise or just the hustle and bustle that happens around it. So that was our first uh, decision, um, or, I mean our first recommendation. Uh, probably the best case scenario for the bottling trailer for aesthetics or for impacts would be inside the enclosed structure. But um, there are some changes in our zoning we can get to that will address uh, the fact that we no longer have a prohibitions against outdoor manufacturing. So this is something we can talk about or have you talk about in your, your discussions after I'm done with the presentation. But as a stopgap measure, we, just, we asked them to move it to the back of the structure uh, and close it in a fence. Um, and then the operations for the bottling of the wine would be back there. I believe they used it 14 times last year. If I'm incorrect, uh, the applicants are here today and they can, they can uh, be more specific, but it's less than 20 times a year the bottling trailer is used. It's a specific made item from Italy. It's inside of like a Wells Cargo trailer. 
Um, and the original idea is that they would take it to small wineries as a side business because they're very expensive to purchase. So that's why it's in a trailer and not, made it, not built inside of their structure. So that was their original intent. It turned out that it's very difficult to level and very difficult to get certified and difficult to pick up and move. And it's not practical to take it uh, into Bonnie Dune and Santa Cruz and Half Moon Bay. So they have not done that. They've left it in, on Industrial Road. So, so that is the first um, section of the appeal, the bottling trailer and also staff's response in summary. Waste disposal. The appeal states that the odor from the debris box can be overpowering or noxious at times, um, and this is an impact. It could also cause uh, uh, issues with uh, vermin and infestation. As a result of this, now prior to tonight's meeting, in the, in the August meeting of last summer, and then also the follow-up meeting in November in front of the zoning administrator, we tightened down the collection uh, schedule for the debris box. So it's 14 to, or it's 24 to 48 hours now, which is, um, as I see uh, staff reports and conditional use permits, the tightest in the city. It's the shortest uh, time frame for pickup. And that's because they do a crush in the, in the, in the fall. And uh, grape residue has a tendency to ferment if it's warm out. And so the necessity to having the debris hauled away quicker um, is important. And so we, you'll find that as one of the conditions that it's 24 to 48 hours. Um, but really what we're trying to do is limit uh, any kind of leakage, um, odors, noxious fumes, or in this case, it lists vermin. So another option would be a uh, debris storage system that doesn't allow any air out of it. It would be an airtight um, system. And so that would be something that could be a, um, a functional uh, response to the condition um, as opposed to having them just take it away every 24 to 48 hours. But in lieu of that design or any information on that kind of a, a technical fix, we have the requirement that it be hauled away in the fall during the grape crush every 24 to 48 hours as a condition. So that, tight, that, I think, shortens the time frame. I believe it was 48 to 72 or up to five days in one of the original le uh, letters from staff. So that had been tightened up uh, during the zoning administrator hearings. And that is also staff's response. Events, the third uh, detail about the appeal were that the CUP does not adequately address parking at the site. Additionally, the appeal states that there isn't sufficient room for shuttle buses. Um, and the off-site parking areas are not used by patrons of Dominico's or would not be used. So if there were shared parkings in um, existence as there are, they're already legally in existence, that the appellant has concerns that they will not be used by uh, patrons uh, or visitors of Dominico's for their special events, um, and that they're concerned that there will still be parking on the Margiotta's property. So as a follow-up to that, um, this goes back again about a year. The applicants, Domenico's, continued or started to work on their shared two new shared parking agreements that are uh, in the staff report, one with a company called our firm, property owner ECI2, and another with Alberts LLC. They're both in close proximity to the venue. One is, is across the street, uh, and one is uh, a building and a half over on Industrial Road. The applicants provided to staff very complete and um, detailed uh, no parking signs, also a letter that they're going to be sending to participants of where they can park for overflow for large events, and then also a pedestrian scaled map that shows where the shared parking areas are, where it's legal to park, where it's not, and also the safe way to cross Industrial Road, as that was a concern over the summer with the appellants that the city would open themselves to liability uh, by allowing a shared parking agreement across the street. These are events that are, our participants are adults. And uh, we didn't, at that time, staff did not have a concern with a shared parking agreement being across the street as there are many busy streets in San Carlos and people park wherever and cross wherever. And uh, it's just not something that we felt would be a problem. Um, and then, of course, following up with the detailed parking information instructions, no parking signs and pedestrian scaled map that the applicants gave us. So we were satisfied with that. With the shared parking in place, the event is overparked. It has a surplus of parking. So considering on-site parking plus the two shared parking agreements. These are some of the parking tables. I, I spoke with a Chair Clapper earlier today. They are a little complex, and for that I apologize. The first one here is non-event uses. I edited a little bit from your staff report. I hoped to be a little bit more uh, clear. The italics are the parts I added for tonight. These are the things that happen inside the building um, that, let me look at these, wine tasting, wine making. These are things now under the new zoning that would not need a use permit. Um, and these are the square footage and the parking requirement under PM2. So we're on both sides of our zoning here, just to give you a little background information. Um, and the total parking required, the technical total parking required, the parking on site are 40, there's 46 spaces. So under these uses, these, these daily uses of the business, not including special events, they're over parked. Excuse me, before you move on with that. So can you explain 
when the square footage is 800 square feet and the requirement is one parking space per 300 square feet, how do you get 6.4 parking spaces? You don't. So that's a good typo. It's over parked. Sorry. There's, you do not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are several places in here within it's, that. I need an Excel where, file over here. So let me, yeah. let me go through it and I'll take okay. a look and see if okay. I can. Because the numbers look like actually they would be required to have a lot less parking. Yeah. Um, and maybe I can explain it when I go through. But thank you. Uh, this is the special events. They have a 10,000 square foot section of the building. It's about, it's about an acre site and they have about a half acre of building and about 10,000 square foot of it is de de dedicated, excuse me, to special events. I'm sorry that this uh, PowerPoint cut off part of the beginning there. These two here, the industrial road, two address on industrial road are the two locations for shared parking. The special events, when we use the calculation for a restaurant, which is one of the, the uh, stricter parking requirements in San Carlos, um, second only to movie theaters, uh, is one parking space required per uh, one per 125 square feet of restaurant area. So in this case, they would need 80 spaces, and with the two shared parking agreements, they have 59 at uh, 1501 Industrial Road, and they have 36 at 1710 Industrial Road. So for special events, they have a surplus of 15. So the third level of this is the applicants ask to have special events during the day. They, do, they don't have shared parking agreements during the day, because during the day, Albert's LLC and the EMC or EM2, um, they have business operations that need their parking from 8 until 5 p.m. So the shared parking agreements, as you're familiar with, typically happen after hours for businesses that are not open on nights and weekends. And that is the, in case, uh, and that is the case here. So Dominico's was interested in having special events during the day, but they don't have an am amount of parking to uh, include a special event that would take up their full 10,000 square feet of event center. So what they wanted to do is say, I want, we want to have special events that don't require shared parking that can be done on site. So a calculation was done in reverse that they have 26, um, uh, they have surplus of 26 parking spaces. And so as, when you do the, the percentage of that, they have a requirement of one for 125 and so small events that require um, less use, uh, less uh, square footage use than 3250 of the event center could happen during the day between eight and five when the shared, shared parking agreements are not in effect. So, and they do have a lot of smaller things. They don't always have 250 people. Sometimes they have uh, fundraisers with a, uh, smaller numbers of, of participants. So the, there's conditional use permit findings. This is a conditional use permit. And uh, the zoning, our zoning under PM2, under the old zoning, allowed the planning commission or zoning administrator to find um, uh, a variety of flexible parking arrangements and shared parking agreements under the code uh, based on entitlements that were being sought by either the zoning administrator or the planning commission. And that's why the uh, shared parking agreements come before you tonight. Uh, as a result, there's a conditional use permit that's attached to that. That's the entitlement that codifies this. Um, and there are findings to be made uh, in order to approve it, and the conditional use permit findings are in front of you on the screen. And we also have a recommendation. Um, and I'm going to go through, I don't know if you want to look at the map. Did you want to look at the overhead maps of the site, Karen? Because I remember we had a discussion about just looking at the map and the location of some of the businesses. I have that if you want to. Well, the map at the beginning was, was fine, but. Yeah, and I created this one. Yeah. This okay. afternoon, uh, the yellow section is the Domenico's property, the Margiotta property, and it may not be exact because I'm just using the county's uh, GIS for plotting the ownership of the buildings, is located on this map north of it and closer to 101. The parking, the shared parking agreement at ECI 2 is just uh, to the left of that on the same side of Industrial Road. And then the Alberts shared parking is just on this map south of the Domenico's uh, site and across the street. The, uh, just to orient you, the Circle Star Theater is in the upper right-hand corner, and the hotel is there to the right of Dominico's. This area here, if we can get the cursor to show you, this is a, like a, a back area that Dominico's has that they are planning to fence for storage, uh, and they have wine-making equipment out there, stainless steel drums and um, all kinds of things that are needed uh, from time to time for winemaking. Uh, the parking for this venue is along here. There is a number of tandem spaces here, not to exceed the, allow, uh, the allowed uh, amount prescribed. We typically want tandem spaces for employees. They don't work quite as well for visitors. They might work for special events. They don't work well for retail or 
uh, wine tasting and things like that. But they would work for a special event, and they're actually quite quite useful for employees, tandem parking. So uh, I think these last 12 spaces are tandem, and the rest of the spaces front the building here. They are nose-in spaces at a 90-degree angle to the building. I think the concerns with parking that the Margiotas have were back here. People drive down this road. It's not a cul-de-sac. It wasn't designed to be a city street. So the turnaround is either in someone's private property or you have to do a hammerhead several times to get out. Uh, so adequate and um, efficient signage is very important for these things. I mean, it's, it's very similar to what we have on East St. Carlos <coughs> Avenue when we had questions about parking for some of those bu businesses. Reminds me a lot of that. Um, and so the, the, the applicants, Dominicos, have worked um, extensively with the neighbors, having conversations about what types of things they could do to reduce parking impacts and make parking on the site more efficient and less problematic for any uh, neighboring business. The applicants also they attached some pictures. We could go through them. They weren't labeled, but I can narrate them. Um, these are operations that are happening along that alleyway at Domenico's. It looks like storage of, or movement of wine barrels. There's a forklift here. They store wine inside. They have a refrigerated section of the building that's designed for wine storage through the doors. This is the bottling trailer that was been in discussion. It's a Hallmark, not a Wells Cargo. Stand corrected. And inside of it, it has machinery that was manufactured in Italy for bottling wine. Basically, you hook up hoses to it and sterilize bottles going one side, like fed in on a, on a mechanized piece of equipment. Um, and they are filled on the inside and bottled and capped and come out uh, full of wine on the other side. And again, it's infrequently used, this piece of equipment. This is the back of the building that I was discussing. So there's the hotel. 101 would be on the left-hand side of this image. And this is the edge of the Domenico building. This, their intent here is to fence this with a permanent fencing. It doesn't have it, something aesthetic. Um, and then materials could be kept back here uh, behind a fence that was aesthetic and um, also give them some uh, security. These pictures were actually provided by the appellant, just as a, just a reminder that this looks like a bottling operation. I'm not familiar with it, but I would have the appellant uh, speak to this and also the applicant. And just more pictures of the side of the building. These are dumpsters, I would assume, associated with Domenico's. And I think that's a duplicate picture. And then also, uh, the appellants provided this map, which has information on property lines. Um, again, there is no public street here, so it goes property owner here has a property line edge, the Minico's property here, property line edge. And so all the travel, in ingress and egress out of, um, to serve all of these businesses is done over private property. There was discussions at the last zoning administrator uh, hearing as well by the Margiotta's legal representation about concerns with um, buses driving down the private property um, and how we condition that and we I, at the meeting I spoke and, and Brian was present I believe Greg may have been also that um, we don't we typically don't condition the access on private property those things are done through um, agreements through the, the title report or through um, things that are on uh, uh, deeded to the property as far as how the ingress and egress goes so when it comes to a conditional use permit or when it comes to drop off and turn around, we would encourage them to do that um, in areas that were safe and practicable to do that. I think buses would make sense to be on industrial road. The applicants um, decided that that made sense. They removed the sign that used to be out on the, the front of the building down at the ground level and put it up on top so that there is a curb cut now where you can drive into the front of the building, as you, the part that faces industrial road, and then drive out another set of curb cuts or exit through that private property, private ingress, egress uh, access point that's shown on the, on the map in front of you. So that takes uh, me through the points that I wanted to make tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll also, while you're deliberating, look at the calculations to give you a final number, because it looks like w at least one of those was over parked in my calculation, and I'll figure out what happened with that, and I will let you know. But I have a recommendation from staff and also a formal motion should you decide to um, make a decision tonight. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Any questions for staff at this point? No? Okay. Thank you. Okay. We, uh, what? I, Dominic Chiricillo. Did I say that right? <laughs> Sorry if I stumbled over that. Good evening. Um, I guess I'll address um, the bottling trailer first. Um, 
I prepared some handouts if, if I can pass them out if that's acceptable um, yes that would be fine <coughs> there's actually um, photos in there that address all three of the, uh, the appeal issues <clears throat> the first one is the bottling trailer um, you know, there's uh, several pictures of bottling trailers at very large wineries uh, in California here. And the mobile bottling lines has kind of a, become a standard in the wine industry. You know, many small and mid-sized wineries use them outside on a regular basis. <clears throat> uh, there was a mention about spills. The chance of spills are virtually none. Uh, wine is, uh, <clears throat> is connected from a tank inside the building. Uh, passed to the bottling truck through a pump. There's valves on the hoses that connect to the machine. There's always a person inside the machine. There's a kill switch on the machine. The chances of a spill are, uh, are pretty non-existent. Uh, as uh, Gavin mentioned, we did agree to relocate the uh, bottling trailer to the back of the property and um, and, and you know put it behind a fenced area that that is uh, that is something you can't see through for aesthetic reasons and we do not use the bottling trailer on a daily basis uh, it's it's used less than 20 days a year um, I also provided you with um, some there was an issue about noise I was able to get some decibel readings uh, that were done on January 10th uh, which I supplied you that along with uh, the town's uh, decibel levels, noise limits. <clears throat> and that's it. That's all I have on the bottling. In reference to waste disposal, we've completed seven crushes um, uh, at this location. We've used the same method of, uh, of, of removal of the pumice. We've used uh, rolled off dumpsters, usually 15 to 20 yarders. Uh, we usually have them dumped within uh, seven days or so. What, we re what we're using, uh, the removal, and what we put in them is grape stems, fermented skins and seeds that are pressed out after wine is made. Um, we cover it. There's a picture uh, showing the dumpster and how we cover it. We tightly cover it uh, pretty much to the ground. Um, to try to avoid any issues. There's never been any issues with vermin or, or any of that for the last six years. Um, we have had a meeting with the hazardous waste specialists in the county of San Mateo. We gave them a tour of the inspected, our property, our dumbness, and our pumice removal uh, as we have been doing it. They had no issue with it. They, uh, they liked that we kept it covered they, uh, they said take precautions for any leakage or spills. Uh, we, we, we've made some uh, improvements with our dumpster company to make sure that it's a sealed unit because one year we did have a leak issue uh, where the, there was a hole in the container we didn't realize, so there was a small leak. We, uh, we, we contained that and cleaned it up immediately. Um, most of the uh, remains either goes to a farm over in Half Moon Bay gets put back into the ground, it's organic waste, or to the landfill. Um, a sealed container is not a good option for us. Um, we, we dump the waste with a forklift that has rotating uh, forks on it, and we use macro bins, which are half-ton plastic uh, bins that you may have seen around wineries uh, that we uh, put the stems into and or the grape pumice and then we dump them into the dumpster, remove the cover, dump them in the cover, recover it. And uh, we have agreed to um, removing the must uh, within 24 to 48 hours, which is going to quadruple our cost of removal. But we've agreed to it. <clears throat> the last issue is uh, in reference to events and parking. I've supplied you with all the proposed signage along with um, the map that we've prepared that's actually on our website. We've also, uh, it's part of our uh, events contract. We've included that. So anybody that has an event 
at our facility. They have to sign that they've received it, and it's actually an exhibit in our agreement with them. Um, in reference to uh, using buses, there are several types of buses. There, most buses are eight and a half feet by 24 feet shuttle buses. Full-size bus is eight and a half feet by 40 feet. Um, we are in an industrial area, and our driveway is frequented uh, on a daily basis by delivery trucks as large as tractor trailer, 18 wheelers. They seem to get in and out without any issues and make their deliveries to Mr. Margiotta's tenants as well as myself and other tenants. So I, I really don't see that the buses are a problem. Um, and there was a request to have an attendant um, on site every time there's an event. I think that's an unreasonable request. We have used, and I've, sent, I've also enclosed, um, a parking valet service and they've done a great job and that's an option to our customer because it's at a charge of 600 plus dollars but we recommend it for large events and um let me see what else do i have mr margiotta has two parking areas uh, as per the plan shows uh if he has a, a real concern about anybody parking in them i mean we propose to put signs there if he allows us if it's still an issue, um, one of his parking areas has a gate. I have no objection to having him close the gate. If he wants, we'll even rope off his other parking area so it's not accessible during hours when his tenants aren't using the parking area. So we're willing to do that kind of stuff um, to help uh, satisfy his concerns. And I think that's all I have right now. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Or? Any questions at this time? Not right now, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Gloria Chiricillo. Oh. I really only put my name up there in case you had some questions for me about the, the events and whatnot. Um, I can tell you about the large events. I can tell you about that because I'm the one that handles that. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but mostly the large events um, are on the weekends. Uh, we've had very few events that have been 250 people. The other night we had Hippocrates there, 200 people. Um, I don't believe there's an issue after 5 o'clock because we go into the shared parking agreements. So we have more than a surplus there. Um, however, we did give them the option if they wanted to have valet parking, they could. And Hippocrates has the money that they went and paid for precision parking to be there and have a compliment to their guests. I wish all of the corporations would do that. Um, we have very few events. I would, I figured it out once, but I would say it's less than five a year where there could be 200 people in the afternoon. One in particular I know was Shutterfly last year. These are large corporations. They bus people in. We had um, another one, 145 people, LaCroix Corp. They bus people in, in the afternoon. Um, so I don't know of any party that we've ever had in the afternoon where there's been 200 cars trying to come to an event at our facility. Um, as far as um, the bottling truck is concerned and the meetings we had um, prior to this, um, we can prove that the bottling truck is not used 365 days a year, that it's used, you know, around 20 times a year because those reports, every time we bottle wine, has to be reported to the feds, to the TTB. So it's on record exactly how many times we use that truck to bottle the wine out of the year. So it is very infrequent. Um, in terms of the noise, if that is the concern about the truck, um, like we said, we would move it to the back, we would fence it in, which would even set it further away than Mr. Margiotta's tenant, Siemens, um, which has front offices. Um, we did the decibel reading, and the town's reading for that zoning area is between 70 and 75, heavy industrial, light industrial, 70 and 75 decibels. We did, um, you saw, I think Dominic gave you that report, that we're below that at the property line an X amount of feet away from the property line. Um, in fact, the neighbors 
um, across from us um, are cabinet makers and construction companies. When they do their sawing in their building, their roll-up doors are open, and we can hear the sawing going on, and we tested that as well, and that's higher than our bottling line. And we only use the bottling line 20 times a year. Um, I guess that's about all I could add. Okay. Any questions? No. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Charles Ribble, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Charles Ribel. I'm with the firm of Fimmel, Jessman, and Ribel, and we represent uh, Russ and Debbie Marjada, and Russ is here also. I, I know we have a limited time here. I don't want to sit and try to go through everything that I put in the letter, but we do have a couple of concerns that I want to highlight. The trailer. What, what we have, perhaps, perhaps the, um, the ordinance that I received from the city is, is not up to date, but the one I have specifically says, completely enclosed building. I looked up building in Webster's Dictionary, and it says, a roofed and walled structure built for permanent use. I don't know whether the city of San Carlos wants its buildings, a trailer to be equated with that, but what you have here is basically an accommodation, a benefit for one property owner that I don't think you're willing to give to everybody else. It talks about a building. The trailer is not a building. And that we have a real problem with that. As you've heard, he has 10,000 square feet that he uses for, for meetings. He's got a building, according, Mr. Um, according to Gavin Moynihan, it's, it's over an acre. You saw the size of the trailer. Bottling lines, if you've been to wineries, I mean, I like wine. Mr. Marjada likes wine. I've been to small wineries in Napa and Sonoma and there is a bottling operation for the small winery. It does not take up very much space. What you're doing is basically saying, gee, Mr. Majada, his plan didn't work the way he wanted to, and now he should, for some reason, get an advantage that nobody else has. That is, let's call my trailer a building. And as long as we call it a building, everything's fine. We don't agree with that, and we don't think that accommodation should be made. There's no reason for it. At the, in the staff report, they talk about it being temporary. Well, they would like it temporary, but for some reason it isn't. Mr. Marjada said that trailer's been there for years now. Why not just either they can move the trailer inside or just move, get a bottling operation and use up, what, 500 square feet of their space? Probably not even that. That's 10 by 50. It's maybe 250 square feet of their space. They put the operation inside then we don't have to worry about anything. Everything is there. If there is a spill, it goes into a drain, and I presume the building is like Mr. Marjada's where it's connected to the sewer treatment. Something spills outside, it, it's not connected to the sewer treatment, it goes right into the storm drains. Things can happen. My understanding, based on talking to some of the other property owners in the area is, there has been a big push to make sure that the industry in all those areas complies with everything that's needed so nothing is dumped in the bay. And that means, at times, some significant expense to the property owners to make sure that they have a self-contained drainage system where there is no opportunity for things to be spilled in the bay. Here, if some of the pictures we had, you notice people are out there cleaning barrels in the driveway. They're cleaning wine barrels in the driveway. That is part of the parking space of their 26 spaces. Whatever comes out of those barrels goes into the surface drains that are there in the parking area and goes out to the bay. That wouldn't happen if everything were an enclosed building as I read the ordinance to require. So that, that's the main problem with that. They're obviously other things that go with it, but we've, we've touched on those. The other, the other problem, the biggest other problem, is the parking situation. People being people, there is parking right there that they see, and we're not talking just on weekends. During the day, 
People come over, it's easy for them to park there instead of going to somewhere else. Uh, I, I understand and we're not, we're not quibbling with the, with the city as far as the number of parking spaces. But let's be realistic. You know and I know that sometimes even though there are say 20 allotted spaces, somebody is using them for something else. The whatever event or whatever is going on, maybe everybody drives his own car instead of carpooling. So all of a sudden you have more cars than the parking that is available. It's very easy to park close to it. I, I know from experience with some of the property owners, they've had the same sort of things happen with the 24-hour uh, uh, fitness across the street. It's just people are going somewhere, hey, here's a parking place, let me park here. And then it puts the onus on Mr. Marjada or his tenants to try to do something so that they can park there and the tenants, clients, and customers can park there. I don't think it is too much to ask to have a requirement that the applicant notify the city and adjacent property owners if they want it when they're going to have one of these events. Notify them in advance. It gives people a chance, maybe we can do something else. That was a requirement that was in the cup before this request for modification. That went away. We also don't think that for a major event that it is any sort of an inconvenience for the applicant to hire an attendant. All we're talking about is one person who may have to wander up and down the parking area for a few hours on a day just to make sure that if he sees somebody coming in, parking there, that those, that couple doesn't come over and walk into the winery. All he'd have to do is bring it to their attention. We're not talking about some extreme requirement that's going to damage uh, the Chiricillo's business. We don't have any problem with their business. Fine. Mr. Mr. Marjada is in that same situation. He likes to be able to use his property, but he is trying not to do anything to interfere with the other people. That isn't the case with the situation that has been going on now and which will, will increase with these new uh, uh, allowances for events and so on. Sure, the business is getting started now. It hasn't been too much. If it goes the way they want it to, there are going to be more of these events. But notifying the city and Mr. Marjada, all they have to do is they have it on their, uh, on their email list. Somebody punches a button in two minutes yeah, we've got an event scheduled for such and such on such and such a day. Mr. Churchillo has tried at times to help things out. I think Mr. Marjada can tell you, yeah, he roped off the parking area at points so people wouldn't park there. All that meant is Mr. Churchillo or Mr. Marjada's tenants couldn't get in there because there's something there keeping people from parking in there. Um, it's, it's a problem. Mr. Believe me, we're not going to have any problem if he wants to put some signs up there to try to help keep people out. I mean, that's, that, that's fine, but having an attendant there when they have one of these functions where it is not a bust-in function, I don't think that's much of a requirement for what the city is allowing them to do there. Mr. Mr. Marjada, actually, it, some of the things that came up here Mr. Marjada will disagree with, but I don't think now's the time to do it. We've got some information in our appeal and so on, but there, there, has been, there have been some problems in the past. We want to get rid of those. I'm sure the Churchillos do. All we're looking for is some reasonable requirements having to do with the benefits the city is uh, giving to the Churchillos. So, do either of you have qu questions? No. Okay. I wanted to make sure I understood you, you were talking about people parking over there. And I, I'm guessing that you're talking, I don't know, Gavin, if we can go back to one of the overheads that shows sure. the property. So I, I know exactly where you're talking about, so I'm not visualizing the wrong thing. Chair Clapper, this is the Chiricello property, and then I can also take you to, did you want the overhead, the Google Earth image? Was that more helpful? Yeah, let's, let's go one? to that. Okay. Yes, that's, that's more helpful. So are we talking about the lower area? That what happens is, is that people, people 
come in here, here's where the, here's where the door is. Here's where the, the parking is over here. It's very easy for them just to go up to, to the top, the, uh, basically the east side, and say, oh, here's some parking over here. Turn in there and park. And um, what's going to happen is, yeah, here's, here's where they're being directed to park. They're being directed to park over here. My mother-in-law is, is elderly. If I told her, let's go here, I'll meet you there, but you have to park over here, that's not going to happen. That's too far for her to walk. A lot of people, they won't be. We don't have a problem with that. All we're asking is, hey, let's just have an attendant there to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, but what you're saying that there, there's a parking issue is, is that one that one building that's across from the, the upper portion of Domenico's winery, then is that, that those tenants then that people are parking in their places? No, no, no. no? no the, the, ten, the tenants we're talking about is more job. That's the, that's the one we're Right, but, but, they're, but they're parking in the... You could just use this as oh, your parking. Oh, okay. So, yeah, right in, right in there, is that the area we're talking about? Yeah, can I, can I help out here a little bit? Yes, please do. Since I own the property? <laughs> yes. Okay. All this back in here, is our parking lot. The gate that Mr. Chalchilla was talking about goes is right, right approximately right here at the end of that point, okay? There's no parking allowed anywhere down through here because it's a fire access to the back. This parking lot right here uh, where, where um, this line is going across, that is not the property line. The pro our property line is up against what we call the Gazaboto building. Bud Gazaboto since the deceased, but taking it so these cars right here that's actually on our property and what happens here is they come in here and just like uh, mr. rival says it's very convenient just to pull them in here this this parking lot is leased by Siemens Corporation which is in this building right here and it's leased seven days a week 24 hours a day they run vehicles at night they have to they have a service company it's actually used to be owned by US filter Siemens has bought them out like everybody else <laughs> and but they do service contracts and they come in come in and out of here at nighttime and on weekends Back here is the same thing. There's three tenants back here, and they also come in and out of here at night uh, as early as four weeks ago uh, This parking lot was full We're under contract with able towing our tenants came in here at 10 o'clock at night couldn't get in and they had to tow out four cars and This was just in the middle of all this going on so there is no controls even though Mr. I mean, Mr. Chalchillo says it's going to be controlled and the signs put up, it doesn't happen. And it, the last thing we want to do is pull somebody's car out of there. You know, it's a terrible feeling when you come out of having a nice event and a nice evening and, and having a $500 tow bill looking at you in the face. Nobody wants it. But on the other hand, you know, we, we can't have people parking back here. It's a liability issue. Um, you know, as far as blocking it off and they've done that without our consent they've come back here and put saw horses and ropes and the same thing here and blocked it off and again our tenants come in there are they going to get out and move them that's not right we have a right to use our own parking lot i'm glad to see that they have all this i, I think this is great I'm, I'm, it's going to be a big improvement um i think though they do need somebody out here monitoring vehicles uh so they don't go back here and park. Um, you know, that, that's, that's all I pretty much have to say on the parking. You know, as far as this trailer goes, I want to give my little two cents here on this. Um, moving this trailer back in here, and I want, I'd like, Gavin, if you could do me a favor. Well, we're going to come back to that. <laughs> I want to come back to the other picture you had up here a second ago. Putting this trailer back in here is actually compounding the problem. When they're doing this bowling operation, which you're not seeing, there's forklifts going up and down. There's 60 foot semis back down the driveway. They've got pallets out there and they've got cases of boxes on, you know, spread out around here. And what's going to happen is all that operation now is going to take place. This, this part of the building is leased out, I believe. Somebody can correct me if it's not, but I believe it's, it's leased. So this operation here now is going to come out here and come down this driveway and come into here. So now we're going to have forklifts and trucks and everything going back and forth down this ingress and egress easement and that's all that easement is for is ingress and egress okay um so that's going on our tenants trying to get out of here are not going to be able to get out right now when they pull a, a 60 foot truck in here and park it to one side 
Um, that kind of works, you know, because you can get around it. If they pull it back here, back in here further, it's, it's not going to work. There's just not going to be enough room to allow that to happen. So if they were planning on putting this, t this trailer back here and everything's going to come through the building, I guess that works, but it's certainly not going to work coming down this driveway. And that's, I don't know how else they're going to get if, there. If I could interject, that's one thing that would, would be a, a real possibility if, if you're insistent on having a trailer is make access from where the trailer is. There's a door back there. If you look at the plans that were submitted by Mr. Tiratillo, there's access to the building back there. Why, if, if they're going to have the trailer back there, if you allow them to do that and have it fenced in, make the access come in through the building, which is very close, instead of coming all the way down that driveway, which is the, the area they're coming down is right where their parking spaces are. So if, if they have something going on and their people are parked there, it's going to be real difficult to get a whole lot done in there. So if, if, if you said, well, we've got to let them have the trailer, well, then fine. If that's what you do, then you ought to have some sort of a restriction so that they have to access the building near the trailer, which there is a door right there. You know, as, as, as far as um, this complaint about somebody complaining, an anonymous complaint, my complaints are not anonymous. I give my name every time. So I'm glad to hear there's anonymous complaints because it's not me. It's an ongoing issue. Um, this, this trailer is a big concern. As far as the noise goes, I've never complained about noise. I don't have a problem with noise. But honestly, I've never heard of noise. It's the stench from the grapes. It's the, it's the juice running down the gutters. You can actually see if you go back here, where this, they parked this dumpster, it has leaked so much that it has taken the surface of the concrete. You can actually see where it's dripped down on the ground, burnt a hole in the asphalt from the, from the sugar, and has actually eroded the top of the concrete off from the juice running down the driveway. Okay? So I'm not exaggerating. Drive out there and look at it. Unfortunately, I, I took some pictures. It doesn't do it any justice, but you can go out there and physically see it. Um, I think. The business they have there is fine. I have no problem with it. I have no problem with the venues at night. I have no problem with any of the people. I don't hear them. Our tenants don't hear them. The trailer and that, that nuisance and the parking in our parking lots is an issue. And that has to and will be dealt with. I have to. I have people back there that are renting those buildings and I have an obligation under our lease to give them what they rented. And part of that is peace and quiet and access to their property, to their space. I have to say. Okay. Do I, do either of you have questions at not this point? At this no. point in time, at the appellant. Not at, not at the moment. So it sounds like what you what you're saying is that you would actually prefer the trailer to be left in the location it's currently in. If there's to be a trailer there, you would prefer to have it where it currently is rather than having it in the back is if it comes down that, that came down and they're going to fence that in unless i want to ask gavin to go back to the parking plan that he had there um i believe as mr rival believes i've read the code it talks about being inside a building i own many properties throughout san carlos i am pounded every time i come in here for a permit and to comply with parking requirements building requirements i know it very well i've been here my whole life in the city I built many brand new buildings in the city. I'm very aware of that. And to allow something like this to happen, you're just opening the door. And when you say allowing something like this to happen, you're talking about treating this as, as a enclosed building. Is that yes? Am I interpreting There's that correctly? Absolutely okay. no reason in the world that 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 bottling plant cannot go in that building. If it's a hard ship, that trailer is eight feet wide. I don't know, thirty feet long. Um, couple hundred square feet less and do it properly like everybody else in this city does I don't see what the problem is he's benefiting by renting out space in the back so maybe he might not rent out the full space maybe he might have to utilize another couple hundred feet of his building but there's absolutely no reason that trailer has to be out in that parking lot it's on operation it's a, there's no sanitary 
There's no handicap access to it. There's no fire sprinklers in it. There's no ingress and egress required by codes. There's one door in, it might be two. Okay, there's no seismic bracing on it. It's sitting up on, on stands. How in the world can we say this is a building that you can put people in to work? And it meets current codes. It absolutely does not meet a current code. It might be something, it's like a, a job trailer. When we pull job trailers on, on projects to, to con construct a job, it's there on a temporary permit. Very, very limited, and it's gone. <coughs> but that's not the case here. This is, he's running the business out of this trailer in a parking lot. And if Gavin could please bring me up the, the plan showing the parking, I want to discuss that just a little bit, since we're looking at. That one, Russ? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna assume. Are we counting these here as, as well, let me get my, are we counting these as double park? No, single. Okay, are these all parking spaces? No. What's all this? Go to the planning commission, not the zoning administration. These are not parking spaces? Not counted for dark. So what we're counting here is down here. And what, what's this, what's these hash lines here? Is this a driveway? Is this a driveway? The uh, the parking plan that they showed, the, um, they were trying to get as many spaces on the site without having to have as many shared parking agreements. So the site plan that they have there shows uh, parking behind the 90 degree parking, which is not allowed. So the staff report doesn't count that. It's just the, the 46 spaces are just the spaces that are uh, perpendicular to the building and then the 12 tandem spaces at the end of the building where, the, where they're proposing to do the fencing. What is this right here? That is where the original sign was. It said Domenico, they put it on the roof, and that's a drive through from uh, curb cut to curb cut. So they're just showing a representation that you could put two spaces there, which is, I think the intent really was to have pick up and drop off there, so. Okay, right here we have an easement, right in front of that building for a sign. So we can't, just so everyone's always aware of that. Okay, and if we have parking here, how how they project for these? I assume these buses are going to pull in on this curb cut right here, mm -hmm. and then drive down through here, and supposedly drive off. Is that the intent? Or are the buses going to unload on industrial road? We hadn't specified. I mean, there's a there's a variety of opportunities for the buses to either pull in and back out, as Mr. Churchill was mentioning, like the semis do. Uh, to pull up on industrial road or to pull through that section Russ, where you're saying you have a sign easement yeah with the two spaces so i i understood in the meeting not to cut you off and i apologize no that's fine I, I i understood in the meeting you know a couple of months ago that the intent was to come off industrial road pulling pulling the front we'll go over here pulling the, pulling the front right here and drive out this way onto the prescribed ingress e egress easement but he's showing parking all through here the bus can't pull through here you're certainly not going to unload them on industrial road. That, that's not going to work. I mean, I don't know. Maybe somebody gets down there in direct traffic. But, uh, and again, it's at night. It's not an issue for us. It's during the days. So when you said the issue is during the, the day, Bus. For the buses. For the buses, okay. Parking is an issue day, night, and weekends due to his tenant's yeah. situation. You know, we have we have dumpsters all piled up out here. There's there's city ordinances that discuss dumpsters. They're not being addressed. They're supposed to be in an enclosed area. That code was passed a number of years back. We're we're required to do that. Where's the dumpster enclosures on, on their plans? We're required to have all our dumpsters in, in behind on anything that goes in for a new use permit. It has to be closed in. All their dumpsters are sitting out in the parking lot. Why? Why isn't it being opposed on them? Gavin, is there any information from a staff perspective in 
No, I mean, I understand. Uh, be yes, I understand Mr. Marjada's concerns, and would, I mean, we echo them too from a planning standpoint. If the bus couldn't come through, I'm looking at the site plan, um, and I don't have a way to call up a live Google Earth image, but um, a bus like a trailer or a semi is only can only be eight feet four inches wide, I think, by law. So there really only needs to be a space or a space and a half um, at the end there for a, a bus to either pull in or drive through to drop off. So the question about an easement for a sign would be a different story altogether. We're not familiar with that. It's not something we've reviewed um, in any of the materials we received to date from either the applicant or the appellant. Actually, but actually, Gavin, it is. We we sent in a uh, uh, the plan I sent in along with my letter has the easement called out on that plan. I stand corrected. It was on that uh, title plot plan with the property lines on it, but it wasn't spelled out in a narrative that. There is an entitlement for a sign there. So, uh, and there's also the ability for a bus to pull in and back out. It's what bus drivers do. But um, the intent would be that there would be sufficient space between curb cuts for a, a bus or a jitney or vehicles to pull in and out if they were doing valley parking. And again, it would be the dedication of a space or a space and a half for the minimum width. So, so I see here on this where it, sh where it, it points out the, s the sign easement. And just to the and going to the east, south of that, or east, or going towards San Jose from there, <laughs> um, there's four it, four parking spaces identified, which I guess would be in that area that they're talking about there being the bus access. I, I have to admit I'm assuming those spaces are not being used because I believe that's exactly where a bus would be pulling in. Okay, so I, well, I can see where the, the sign easement is located, and, and depending on where the last parking space running along the side of Domenico Winery would be, that would probably dictate more whether there's vehicle access, but I'm, I'm not in a situation to be able to say that based on just looking at this right now. So I would say that's... Then the, the other issue here with this plan, not to, you know, there required X amount of people 250 people, 200 people venue requires X amount of handicap spaces that are not even shown on here. It has to have handicap to the front door. Current building code calls for a walkway from, from their building, in front of the building, down to the city access, down to the city sidewalk. That's not shown. That's in your latest building codes that have been passed and approved. So they have no access here for handicap. They have no handicap parking shown. They have no walkway shown. Um, how's all this work? I'm glad that planning, you know, is staying as great. But there's a lot of issues here that need to be addressed, and they're not being addressed. Okay. Any other comments that you wanted us to take into consideration? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else here who wanted to speak? Yes, would you like to, would you please come up to the microphone? And please I just, just want to make a comment. Please state your name again. Dominic Chiricello. Thank you. Um, I don't want to go to war with my neighbor in front of the commission or any time. Um, I don't agree with what he said. And um, there is handicap parking. It may not show it on that map. But there is. You can go by there tomorrow and take a look. And there is a walkway. Um, we provided for that. When we moved into the building, it was required. We did it. Now, if there's an additional requirement, we'll do it. In reference to dumpsters, his dumpsters are on the side of his building, along with pallets, et cetera. I don't want to go this way, but if I have to, I will. I have photos of Siemens trucks parked in the driveway all hours of the day loading and unloading, <clears throat> and I'll be glad to share them with you. Uh, there's also been spills from the filters, and I picked up a bag of parts. I, I really didn't want to go this route, but um, I guess I should submit this information.
I'd be glad to address any specific questions or any of the issues that Mr. Weibo or Marjada brought up. Thank you. It's a little neighborhood. Um, Mr. Marjada is an absentee landlord. My wife and I are on the property a minimum of five days a week. We take pride in what we do. We try to keep uh, everything under control. Things sometimes are not uh, perfect, and um, we do the best to run a, a, a good business and try to keep things going. Um, so if you have any specific questions in reference to Mr. Marjorie's concerns, I'll be glad to answer them. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I, d I do. Oh, do you have questions? Sure. Now? Okay. Absolutely. I don't know if these have already been asked of you by staff or have been considered, um, but why not have your bottling unit inside your building? Well, I think that's a, a fair question to ask. Yeah, it is. Um, right now, our space, we, we have con space constraints internally. We do have a tenant. This economic conditions uh, that we've had to live with in the last three or four years have been rough on us uh, in, in, in business. Um, to give up space right now uh, would be um, would be asking tenants to move out. Um, I'm not saying that down the line that can change. Uh, I'm open to that, but um, uh, right now I need the rent from my tenants. I I, uh, I live with situations in in that little driveway that I don't complain about, and um, you know everybody's trying to make a living. And uh, uh, let bygones be bygones. And I don't think uh, the complaints that Mr. Mojadi have uh, are that severe. Uh, I understand his concerns about parking. We've done everything we can, and we will continue to do that. Uh, we, put, we, you know, we haven't had a chance to put the signs up. We made several attempts to different parking arrangements. Uh, I apologize that we haven't had an updated plan for you to review. In reference to his, his sign easement, it's a five foot by seven foot sign easement. And there's still plenty of room to get past his easement to where trucks, buses, cars can get by. Um, we have alternative ways for the buses to enter. We can have our, if it's a daytime event, we can, uh, we can have all our employees park at the rear in the stack parking, have the bus pull up onto our existing parking, rope it off. They can unload there and load there. Um, not an unreasonable situation. Okay, so on your plan uh, that says future tenant space, is that the space you're talking about, or is that included in the 4433 for Clo uh, Clodilla Tech? I don't have that exhibit with me. But, um, do you have that uh, so I can yeah. refer to it? Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, close to the tech, um, his lease was expiring when we submitted this. They just renewed their lease. They're in the process of building their own winery. Um, but at this point in time, they're there indefinitely. So okay. that's why I'm saying things may change as time goes on. But right now, there are tenants. I need the rent. And I would probably try to re-rent it when they vacate because uh, financially it makes sense for us to have rent. Okay, so on, on this map you see in the lower left there, it says future tenant space, 2553 right. square feet. Right. That's what close to the tech is occupying. They are occupying that? Yeah. So that's included in the 4433. Right. They're actually occupying the catering kitchen area as well. Mm -hmm. That's a future uh, space that we intend to uh, occupy and use to enhance our business. Mm -hmm. Is there, so another question I had related to that bottling unit. Um, the, for the times that you're actually bottling, uh, would there be, because that seems to be, the, I guess, the times where it's most egregious as far as the impact goes, there's an impact from a noise and activity standpoint, uh, is there space inside of your warehouse for those 20 days to, or your facility to have that in there and then have the unit outside as outdoor storage? It's not a building. Are you, you're not going in there the other 340 days a year, right? No, it's, it's, it basically sits locked up. 
Right. So on the 20 or so days of the year that you're actually doing bottling, uh, have you considered moving it inside your building? Um, at this point in time, no, we haven't. Um, it's... Uh, Gloria is going to talk to this. On that. Okay. So there's 20 days out of the year. It could be mm -hmm. 15, it could be 25, 20 days, right? Más o menos. They don't happen consecutively. Right. So we could bottle wine in June for mm -hmm. a day and then not bottle it again, you know, maybe in August. So it doesn't happen consecutively. So we can't take that trailer and move it in and out every time we're going to use it. Just because of the way that it has to be um, secured with the blocks. Leveled. Leveled. You know, there, there's, there's, what's the cost of the bottling line in there? It's very. It's $150,000 machine. Piece of equipment. It's very temperamental. Um, every time you change a bottle and put a different shape bottle in it, you have to readjust everything. So to move that trailer in and out every time we were going to bottle, it's just, it's just inconceivable. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to stay in one spot. It's not something that you can do that. It's not set up like um, uh, these mobile bottling lines that are um, tractor trailer, 40 foot, 18 wheel tractor trailer units. Um, this is a small unit that come into a place, they level down and, they, and they're there for a day and then they leave. So this is something we use periodically and it's not consecutively. So we couldn't keep doing that. Okay, um, so I see where staff is. Where I think I see where they're going on this, and at least the reasons why. Right. And where it is currently now, um, Mr. Margiotta said that, I, I believe I heard him say, he would even rather it even stay where it is right now. Where it is right now, I don't know if you want to put one of the plans up, but right next to it is the roll-up door in mm -hmm. the winery. Yep. So that is where the forklift would, the forklift would come out, makes a 45 degree turn, drops the pallet with the empty bottles right at the bottom of it. It's not going back and forth up and down the driveway as he says. When the bottles go in, they come out, they're filled, they pick that pallet up, they're going right back into that overhead door. So there are not trucks going up and down when the bottling is happening. Well, can I also address that? Because the way our parking is, and if you saw, we tried to show um, perpendicular spots behind the other spots, there's enough room to drive behind cars my forklift. I do it all the time. And uh, so I don't have to get in the roadway, even if we were to go up and down the driver with a forklift. Driver, the forklifts are used uh, by Siemens every day to load and unload their stuff. They go in the driveway, they unload trucks. It's, it, we're, we're I, don't, really, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to even try to address those. That's a separate yeah, really issue. Yeah, so what, what I'm saying is that I, I have uh, the ability to stay on my property. You know, I may have to go. Uh, there, there is a speed bump there. I might have to just avoid that. But I'm not going up and down blocking traffic. Okay. Which brings me to my next question regarding traffic. Uh, and, and I guess this is another question I think is probably a fair question. And I know money's probably an issue with it, but um, why don't you have someone monitor traffic for your events as far as the parking? It'd probably be just one person in the parking lot just, just directing them, saying, yes, no, get out. Many times, Dominic and I yeah. are out there ourselves because even though, you know, like I go downtown and I can park in San Carlos and I get my car towed away or a ticket because I didn't see the sign. It says unauthorized vehicles will be towed. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Margiata has signs on his property already that say that. We have had where people have gone and parked there anyway. They see them. They come into the event. I will tell them. We make an announcement. If you park in, and this is where the most, where a lot of part of the problem is, is this little section between the two buildings for Siemens. Mm -hmm. um, if you parked there, or gone behind that fence in the back, you will be told to move your car. Because, and they're like, but it's after hours. It's closed. Nobody's back there. I said, it doesn't matter. You need to get your car out of there. So we do the best we can. Many times we are out there doing that. And um, prior to the signs that you have there, mm -hmm. um, we have like, um, what do they call them, A-frame signs that instead of, we did at times at night after 5 o'clock at 6 o'clock, that area between Margiatas and the front 
building, mm -hmm. um, put you know caution tape so that people didn't go in there. All the Siemens employees were gone, and we did that to alleviate them being towed because it they don't care if they're towed; it reflects on us. You know, mm -hmm. um, we have done that. Since doing that, we then went to a little A-frame sign so the people see it right in front of them. Do not park here; you will be towed. And then we put another A-frame sign right at the front of that yellow point there mm -hmm. that tells them additional parking there or there. Plus, we've already told you about the maps. But there are many times that we are out there doing it ourselves. We would consider having someone there. I don't think it's something that would have to be a, a person there at every event. I think there may be something for the larger events. I don't think it'd be required for is there a number of people that where you'd say, hey, we anticipate X number of people, we probably should get someone there? Or is that, I mean? Absolutely, just like the other night with Hippocrates. It was like, all right, they're going to be driving here 200 people, figure two per car. You know, it would be best, it would be in everybody's best interest if you went for valet parking. No problem. It was a piece of cake. We Not instruct our, sale, our, our yeah. event salesperson yeah. to recommend it. Uh, on a regular basis. In fact, she just booked another party, and they're going to use the uh, valet service. Yeah, the, the reason I, I bring up a person or uh, some other methodology other than the caution tape, it's, although that's well intended on your part, mm -hmm. I'm going to take we a guess and say that, that Mr. Yeah, Margiotta doesn't, exactly. doesn't want that because he is renting out his property to, exactly. to people who expect it, even if they don't use it, but very infrequently. Exactly. But it's their right to be able to use it and not have impeded flow to it. So Absolutely. I understand that's that. That's why we stopped doing that and we put a sign out there so that yeah. it doesn't block access. It just says, if you're not winery, don't park here. And, and we haven't posted the new proposed signs yet because we're still in this holding pattern. You're an optimist. I like that about, about people following the signs. Well, <laughs> I know. Better than no signs. Yeah. You That's all I have. You try. <laughs> right. Thank you. Any other questions? Actually, I have a couple of questions for staff here. Um, so what are the current rules for outside manufacturing? <laughs> yeah. Excuse my uh, hoarse voice tonight, but I'll try and kind of put us where I see this application. This is an existing use permit that's been approved for this site. It's been up since, in effect since 2004. Um, the three issues raised on the appeal are the bottling trailer, the waste disposal, and the, the parking and special events. So the first, with regard to the bottling trailer, um, the prior zoning, although it does say that uh, manufacturing and fabrication must be inside a building under the old zoning, the new zoning, does not have that limitation, but we're under the, this application was brought in under the old ordinance, as I understand it. However, under the old ordinance, you could have outdoor manufacturing fabrication with a use permit. And under the 2004 um, conditional use permit, item number 12 talks about the cr sound generated, generated by the crushing machine and bottler sh shall in no event exceed 64 dBA, et cetera. And, it, and this condition is largely repeated <coughs> as um, number 18 uh, in the new um, revised conditional use permit. So it's, uh, although it's, it seems to be an issue and, it, and it's causing some problems up, um, apparently on, on uh, or at least it's alleged to be causing some problems, it's it's le it's legally there now. Um, it was allowed under the 2004 conditional use permit, so it's largely irrelevant to say that the planned manufacturing zoning um, doesn't allow that type of use because we allow it uh, per pursuant to a use permit, and it's and it's there and it's legal. And um, there is some fine tuning, I think, intended to to make it um, a little bit um, more compatible um, in condition 18. Um, the second item is the waste disposal. I think there's a pretty long condition in the new modified use permit, uh, number 16, that talks about that. Um, there are other avenues of enforcement that the city would have uh, other than the use permit, but we're, um, I think staff is intending to document that so that if that the, 
very detailed condition number 16 is violated, we'd have the additional remedy in addition to the health and safety code and the county environmental health and all the other avenues that could enforce this. Um, we'd have the additional remedy of a revocation proceeding through the use permit. Can, so I think it's a Before you move on on that, sure. trash enclosures, are they typically required in these locations? And if they are, why are not both companies required to have them? Yeah, um, Commissioner Marsters, I spoke with the building official. Actually, this section of the um, Municipal Code, Chapter 18146, specifies that the building official is in charge of determining when a trash enclosure is required, and it's based on the valuation of improvements to the building. So I had a, I had a, uh, a chat with uh, our building official, and he uh, showed interest in maintaining his review authority over when the trash enclosure should be uh, required based on uh, upgrades or evaluation changes to buildings. So Okay. And I, I, I know you may have other questions, but I, I just want to kind of um, put us back to where we are. Um, I, I think the issue that we've heard a lot of testimony tonight is about the events. Um, the, the, the initial amendment to the use permit, you might recall, was to uh, um, loosen up some of the requirements on notifying for events and to legalize um, and document the um, off-site parking agreements to try and mitigate, or at least to include those provisions in the use permit. So I, you've heard a lot of testimony about that, and I think uh, Commissioner Dooney's um, asked some relevant questions about um, having valet or, or some other uh, enforcement mechanism. Um, out, I, I consider that to be sort of outdoor and um, directing of the, of the parking. And you know, if, if that's something that Remember, keeping in mind that this is an amendment to the existing use permit. So if that's a f something you need in order to make the finding to approve the use permit, um, and there's two findings in the staff report, I think that's something that you could develop. But I think the first two, um, of course it's up to you to make the findings, but the staff I think has gone um, in a great detail to try and address the first two concerns. One, I think, again, as I said before, the bottling trailer, it's already permitted. Um, I don't think it's relevant to um, say that it's not allowed in that zoning district when we actually have a use permit for it. The waste disposal, um, we're not only adding a condition, but we also have other remedies under, under our code or to, uh, and complaints can be made to county environmental health. Um, it's true that um, we do not want um, any kind of um, material that could be considered a pollutant going into the into the storm drain or into the creek, and you know there's a whole. Uh, I mean that would be a, a severe violation that could be subject to criminal penalties. Um, we're not we don't put that in our use permit, but because it's it's a it's an enforcement a different enforcement mechanism. But there, those are definitely available, and, and um, you know the the bottling, the person who's bottling or the <clears throat> the operation really needs to be careful about that, and and I'm sure they're aware of that. So and that so I think we come back really the issue that you have before you is is the parking adequate from these parking um, uh, offsite parking arrangements? Um, is there a, enough of a problem that you need to add some conditions? To, uh, so to enable you to make the finding um, for the change in the events. Thank you. Commissioner Marsters, did you have any other um, questions? No, I think, I'm, I think I'm okay with that. Thank you. No other questions? No more, no more no. questions? Okay. Um, are we ready to make a motion to, to close? close? Before we um, make a motion to close, um, the one thing that I have to dis disclose is that I have actually attended one of these special events before. Um, so just in the interest of letting everybody know, I have actually attended one of the special events. So. Oh, we, yes. Is, is there anyone here who hasn't already spoken or would like to speak again before we close the public portion of the hearing?
Uh, going back to these, this dumpster issue, and Mr. Chachillo is correct, there's dumpsters outside our building of 1661 that belong to Siemens as well as pallets. We are currently 99% done in renewing our lease, and that is definitely on the addressive issue, and the dumpsters are being removed and placed inside the building for building codes that would be required. Um, and off the off that driveway area um, We couldn't do much with it in the last five years because it was not in their lease But it's in their new lease that will be to taking place on uh, March 1 that will do that will be gone um, Also on that particular property on that particular building 1661 there is no area um that allows for an outside dumpster, dumpster enclosure as there is on Mr. Chowchilla's area. If you drive by, you'll see that, okay? Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. I, second thing, I am not an absentee landowner. Uh, I have over 20 tenants in San Carlos, and I am, here, I am a well and live. This is, only, this is the only one problem child I have and it thing needs to be addressed. And as far as that trailer goes, um, they themselves said it's a portable trailer designed to be transported to facilities for the day to make wine. So it can't be that difficult to move that trailer in and out when it's not, when it does not have to sit there all year round so they can bottle wine 20, 20 days out of the week. It's a portable trailer that can be moved. They've said it themselves, it's designed to go to events for the day. And I was my intention, understanding and when the first original use permit was applied for, and I could be wrong here, but I think I was right, that it was a temporary situation, a temporary deal. And now you're saying, well, it's kind of a permanent deal and it's been there. Well, two rights don't make a wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> you know, so, um, it's not a hardship. Um, it's a very thriving business. He stated it himself. It's taken off and it's going and it's growing. Then let's do business like we're supposed to do it and put the bottling plant inside the building where it belongs. That's all I have to say. Uh, one thing I, I would like to just be sure, even though I'm, Greg and I may disagree on a couple of things here, um, having to do with the bottling plant, but if the commission is decided that they're definitely going to allow the outdoor trailer there. It seems to me, based on what both Mr. Churchillo and Mr. Marjada said, that instead of being in a fenced enclosure in the back of the building, it should be a fenced enclosure right next to the loading ramp, and basically fairly close to where it is now, and have the fence there, do all of those things there instead of in the back of the building. And at least if, if that were your decision, it would probably provide less disruption and apparently would be easier for Mr. Chiratillo also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, do I hear a motion to, to close the public hearing? Uh, I'd no? like to actually ask. Two pews on the same page. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mr. Ch Churchill, could you please come to the microphone? So based on the, the last comment about the trailer, if we decided to leave the trailer outside the building, um, it, it, I guess the question is, is it better for you to have it where it is right now and to put a fence around it where it is or to move it around to the back and have a fence around it back there? It would be easier to leave it where it was and, and fence it, leave it where it is. Okay. Fence it. Okay. It's easier to access for, for you know, movements. Okay. Would a fence around it disrupt the use of it? No, it shouldn't. Where it is. Okay. Thank you. 
Move to close public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, discussion. Who wants to lead off? Don't, don't all jump in there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think the, the compromise with the trailer um, is probably to leave it right where it is and put a fence around it. Um, if it were really easy to move, um, they probably would be moving it and using it at other locations. Um, uh, I understand the the balancing of that or the leveling of that trailer must be extremely complicated um, even though it is supposed to be hauled around um, to other locations I, I still think that um, getting it level is probably a significant um, issue as far as um, a lot of the little things that I've heard it, it sounds like um, issues going back and forth and and we're going to ignore most of those or at least I'm going to ignore most of those um, the big one for me is the parking and if there is a whether to put a a, um, a tendon out there whether to have um, some sort of notification that was asked for at a level um, that's appropriate for the size and I'd, I'd like to talk to the other commissioners about whether that's a hundred people whether that's a hundred and fifty people whether that's two hundred people um, and I I don't necessarily know that or or think that the city needs to be notified in some of these cases but I think a courtesy notification to the surrounding businesses when you got to a certain level of of um, uh, attendance at at the special events, might be something that we want to consider. Could you say that last part again, please? Well, it it as far as parking, um, yeah, is there a level at which we want to consider? Um, notifying the neighboring businesses and is there a level at which point we um, would want to require an attendant and it could be at the 150 it could be at the 200 person level but at some point the parking becomes um, a bit of a struggle for um, and, and and I've been at special at a special event where I walked in. The first thing they told me is to go move my car because it was obvious that I had parked it in a location where it was not um, going to remain there for very long. And and so I know they're putting in the effort and I know they're trying to do the right thing. It's just at what point, um, if if at all should we make that a requirement okay so you're saying that with we can come back to those but those would coming up with leaving the trailer in place and some definition about how number of people triggers managing the parking would allow you to to make the findings yes then. All right, Commissioner Divney, what, what would it shorter. take for you to make the findings? I'll be shorter. Uh, regarding bottling and uh, waste, I can make the findings as outlined in the staff report. Regarding uh, the parking, I think I can make the findings the way they are. Uh, they are doing what they can, and they have some signs that I think if they go out in packets and they're doing what they've been doing, and they put up the signs at these uh, locations they proposed, I can make the finding. I, I just don't so want to micromanage. So you're, you're supporting putting, moving the trailer per the staff report? Is that what you're saying? Or are you? No. 
No. Uh, yeah. Where it is is fine. I okay. should have I okay. should have said that. But Thanks for the clarification. I thought that's what your point yeah. of view. I wanted to clarify that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so if the, if the trailer is left in, in, in its current location, it looks like that takes up six parking spaces. Would that be a, about right, Mr. Moynihan? Uh, as they have it set up now, they park parallel to it, and it's against the building, and there's a sufficient width on the property between the PL and the building that they just park pulling, nudging up to it. Okay, so, so there would be no impact on the number of parking spaces available is that what you're I think the only impact would be if we looked at what type of fencing they do and what kind of clearance they need and we hadn't ever discussed the clearance to fencing on the side there but it would be something to look at there is still a surplus of spaces so if anything we'd make a change to um, the amount of daytime events they would have without needing shared parking because that's really the only impact their day-to-day -day operations are over they're over parked so in combination with any recalculation you do of how many spaces are required you're comfortable the staff can can yes and actually the calculation is off by was it six spaces and that's probably twice the width of the bottling trailer because I think it's a 30 foot long okay. trailer so okay so yeah I I, I would agree that I'm, I'm fine with leaving the the trailer where it is it does seems like it, it does align with functionally with the with the building and doesn't seem to actually be the source of of problems other than freeing up parking spaces but if it looks like we can come up with an adequate number of parking spaces for typical um, daytime activities then then that would be fine and, and my feeling is it's it, parking management is is always a, a tenuous area of when you're dealing with varying numbers of, of vehicles and I think it would be hard for us to define a, a number of people that would be the trigger when I think there's a lot of other things that fit in with the with the solution part of which is the valet parking so would you say gee you have to have an attendant in addition to the valet parking or it just like you were saying Commissioner Dibney micromanaging the the business aspect of that and hopefully putting on my Pollyanna dress or hat but I don't think she, Pollyanna wore a hat um, that perhaps this could be a fresh start on coming up with in a collaborative way how, how to better manage the parking in that area regardless how many people are are attending events and for everyone to work together on it so I, I think I would be fine with making the findings also so so then addressing Commissioner Marshers uh, addressing your thoughts about the parking management and a, and a number of people triggering other things what I, I can live with it either way. I was just looking to see if that that was something that we were interested in doing, and I, I can live with with the parking the way it is. Um, the one thing that I didn't hear either of you mention was if the trailer actually stays where it is, should it have a fence around it? Whereas in the when it was planned on being moved into the back area, it was going to be um, surrounded by a a fence and um, I, I just want to hear your thoughts about whether you want to have a fence if it stays where it is what do you think Commissioner give uh, from an aesthetic standpoint it may be worth it I don't know if it's a conversation piece for for the business to say yeah this is our bottling unit I I don't know I, I don't know and I don't know if there are setback issues either uh, associated with that my concern would be from a safety point of view for being able to get in and out of the building as well as in and out of the trailer with a, a fence because the fence that was proposed in the back was at a further distance from the trailer and if this fence might be too confining to allow safety access in case there was any kind of a an emergency or accident and the other thing that was appealing about the fence in the back was in terms of concealing the other all the other stuff that's that's back there mm -hmm. I mean I still like the idea of having a fence in the back even if the trailer isn't there but again that's purely aesthetic so any any mm. thoughts from staff or would we'll just leave leave that up well, to staff in terms of, of whether yeah, there's fencing 
Commissioner Clapper, um, historically you've gave, given staff some direction when you didn't have um, a clear set of plans. I, it, if the idea is to provide a screening um, fence around, it doesn't necessarily have to go completely around it. Um, it could be on two sides or perhaps three sides. Um, or, you know, if it needs, if they need access to it, there can be gates so that they open and get out of the way. And the idea is to screen it um, from the right of way or, or from other buildings. You could give that discretion to staff and that would become part of the conditions. And, and I'd be comfortable with that. You know, I, I, I like that idea. Okay, so so that we're clear on what it is we're changing. Do we want to specifically identify which numbered items in the conditional use permit would be changed, or do we want to? I, I think we can do staff? it easier. I think we can do it easier than that. Okay. <coughs> I, mean, I could make a motion and you can see what you think about that and if it's adequate we get a second or not or it could die I mean you can go that way please proceed that's right so I move that the Planning Commission deny the appeal application of Russ and Debbie Margiata and uphold the decision of the zoning administrator with the following two exceptions regarding the location it's proposed uh, in this uh, motion that the bottling unit remain at its current location and the second exception has to do with aesthetics and fencing regarding that same bottling unit that we have staff work with the applicant and staff has discretion to address that and uh, I'll continue with the rest of the uh, recommendation here for the project located at 1681 to 1697 Industrial Road of San Carlos based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Did that give an adequate level of clarification that you heard from us in that motion? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, there's a 10-day right of appeal. Okay, next item on the agenda. C, consideration of condi conditional use permit and architectural review for a new 60-foot tall monopole and microwave communication equipment at 700 Crestview Drive. Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Gavin Monahan, and I will be taking you through the application of the California Water Service Company for uh, some internal communication uh, equipment that they need to put on their property. Specifically, this falls under our wireless antenna ordinance, uh, and their request is to install a 60-foot monopole with two microwave dish antennas mounted to the top of it at 700 Crestview Drive. So planning staff handled this application similar to that of a wireless communication facility for the cell phone providers. Um, however, in this case, it's a proprietary device. It's a pr proprietary installation. Um, and the goal of Cal Water is to have uh, increased and better communications between their sites. They have um, a strict requirement to know what level the water and the tanks, what the tank level is. Also to know if there's an overflow, if one of the tanks is stuck on the pump and the tank's overflowing. Um, and as a result um, of overflows, they can face stiff fines and I think have in the past. So this equipment, the monopole and antennas are uh, designed to help address those issues. So again, we handle this under our antenna ordinance uh, because it looks and feels just like a standard 60-foot uh, monopole antenna request. So the location is up on Crestview Drive. It's uh, near Los Vientos Way in the corner of Crestview. It's on an existing Cal Water site. They have one tank. Uh, at that particular location, some um, support equipment, pumps, uh, there's a pump house. There's also a county lattice antenna that you'll see if you went by there that ha handles our, or uh, facilitates communications for the county. It's proprietary for them. They were not interested in sharing. That was our first question for staff uh, of staff to the applicant. 
could you mount your uh, equipment on an existing tower, which is in our uh, preferred location um, group for our new ordinance? And the answer was no, that the county needed the antenna. And then also there's a specific, this type of equipment, there's a specific line of sight that's required. So the water tank site on uh, 700 Crestview is gonna be in communication with the site, I think actually in San Mateo. Cal Water's here tonight, and they can correct me if I'm wrong with that. And they need to have a line of sight communication uh, so they can't be put at different uh, uh, altitudes on the pole like the cell phone carriers are able to do. So this necessitated them to install a new 60-foot monopole on the site. I would also mention that uh, this particular site, you notice there's a big gravel section just to the right of the water tank. There are plans to install a new tank here. Uh, there's two new water tanks going in, and this is one of the locations for it. We cleaved this application off. It was a separate application for the monopole and antennas from the application for Cal Water to install the water tanks. We wanted to review this one under the FCC shot clock just to be on the safe side. And also because the water tanks are subject to sequel review and are going through environmental, uh, environmental process now, and the wireless uh, monopole and antennas are not subject to sequel review. So we, the applications are actually separate, but um, we treated them separately. Normally we'd combine them, all things being equal, because it's e easier for review and for uh, conditioning the property. But in this case, you're gonna see the two uh, requests separately. So the general plan designation is single family. It's zoned R1. The new zoning is RS3. Um, existing land use is water storage, and the surrounding uses are single family residential, mostly large lot and R1 LD. The request is for the 60 foot monopole and two microwave antennas. The antennas will be used for internal communication. One's mounted near the top, the top of the, probably the diameter of it's close to the top of the 60 foot. The second one's in, uh, midline mount is approximately five feet down on the, on the pole. The pole's located in the back of the lot as you're on Crestview towards the, there's a single family residence there. Um, it's close to the, closer to that house than the rest, but it's actually the preferred location because it's off Crestview. So it's driving down the street on Crestview, you won't see it. Los Vientos, it's difficult, if not impossible to see. We actually went all the way down to Best Court on a site visit and you can just sort of see the top of the lattice tower poking through and the two are similar heights, approximately 60 feet. So it, putting it in the back of the lot is, is really the preferred location for it because it'll screen it from the majority of, of, of the, the views that are found in that location. And there are significant views on, in that neighborhood. Uh, because of that, we had, sorry, my wheel is moving too fast tonight. We had Cal Water do outreach. We asked them to conduct some neighborhood outreach. They had a meeting during the day um, and had the site open and send out an invite to the radius list that we use for planning commission of 300 feet. They didn't have anyone attend and we decided and Cal Water also thought it was a good idea to have one not during the work day because this was a Monday through Friday happening. So they planned a follow-up open house site um, tour day on a Saturday and I believe had no attendance as well. And this, they were both noticed. We, um, as are required of all planning commission and conditional use permits, we did a public notice 10 days prior to tonight's meeting and have not received any uh, comments from neighbors, concerned or happy or otherwise. Uh, so there was basically three sets of separate outreach and we have not received any information um, as of uh, 4.30 this afternoon. So the project request the, on the left is the existing county communications lattice antenna and on the right is the proposed monopole with the two uh, microwave antennas on the top. Behind this tank, this is actually, tank is not here, this is the proposed tank, but behind this tank is, there, is a pump house. It's approximately eight or 10 feet high. It's like a CMU structure. Uh, and the antenna would be just to the end of that. And this, what you're seeing here in this cropped photo is the proposed tank, the new proposed water tank. With that new tank, we will be con we'll condition the site for things like landscaping and any upgrades we need to do for impervious surfaces under NPDES um, or any other types of noise attenuating things for pumps um, or changes to structure or things of that nature. But in this case, they don't have a proposal. They're not asking for entitlements for changing any ground mounted equipment. Unlike the cell phone carriers that have the big boxes that need to be installed for um, um, transmitting the data, this is not the case for this Cal Water application. So it's just a monopole and antennas. There's a couple of project views that the applicants included. This is looking west per the, I, I used the directions that were actually on the plans. Uh, I think they're just slightly skewed, but looking west towards the site, um, if I can get my mouse down here, here is the existing tank. Uh, this is some of the equipment. I believe this is equipment that has uh, equipment in it for the county lattice tower. The back, a little bit further back here is the pump uh, house for Cal Water. And then this is the proposed view looking west once the, monopole is installed. There's quite a nice tree screening here 
And again, not on this application because um, with the proposal for the tank coming in and with the existing extensive vegetation, we did not require um, new landscaping. But with the tank landscape, with the tank pro uh, proposal, they are proposing to add a tree, at least one tree in here. We were out at the site and it is fairly well vegetated. So one tree may suffice, maybe they need a few more, but we'll handle those types of landscape screening when the uh, tank is in front of you for entitlement. This is another set of project views, again, with the existing lattice tower prior to the installation of the monopole and then after. So the zoning compliance and consistency, these all need to be met in order for you to find um, an approval tonight. And these are the required findings under our wireless section of 1818070A. And then the conditional use permit findings is required to uh, entitle it with a conditional use permit. And the monopole is what needs the conditional use permit under our antenna ordinance. This is actually reviewed under our new wireless ordinance. And the major changes to our new wireless ordinance were giving a preferential site and review um, treatment to things that are non-residential areas and industrial or on buildings. Uh, and so you go through this checklist of sort of what's best down in the industrial area on a building screen from view and more than uh, X amount of feet from a residential. And then you move up the preferential uh, list. But in this case, because it's proprietary and it's required on a Cal Water site, those preferential locations down on an industrial road or by US 101 are not practicable. So um, it basically follows back to the entitlements and the reviews that you have seen previously for our cell phone or wireless antenna facilities. And then staff has a recommendation of approval tonight. I will leave this up actually with the formal motion should you decide to vote on it and approve it tonight. And I'm here to answer any questions. Also, are the applicant, David Hyatt, who's with On Air and Cal representatives of California Water Service Company are also here tonight. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We did, I always add one more thing. We did change a few of the conditions just slightly for ones that were not appropriate for or not as applicable uh, for the water company as opposed to the cell phone carriers. Mostly the wording because the uh, cell phone applicants never own their property. So we have some things about getting permission from the property owner and those, uh, some of those requirements didn't make a lot of sense since the applicant or the owner of the poll is also the property owner. So that's probably really the only change that you'll see carry, uh, from the previous reviews that you've done. Okay, Commissioner Marsters, any questions? Uh, just one or two. Um, is there a possibility that uh, additional antennas could be co-localized on this pole? Yeah, we would encourage that if an applicant came back and said, hi, we're Sprint and we'd like to put some antennas on the pole. I think it would be subject to the technical requirements of their monopole or microwave and how far they need to be and others in this room could probably speak to, to more technical answer for that. S Steve's laughing. Um, but yeah, we would encourage that. Just, okay. So if you're leaning towards modifying a condition, I could also think that that would make sense. But we, it's in our ordinance that the co-location is a preferred thing. So it, it's, it's a, it's already, it didn't used to be built into our ordinance and it, as clean as it is now, and now it's clearly built into our ordinance. So as a preferred uh, way of handling a new site, so it would be to co-locate it on this monopole. Which sort of leads me to my second question, and that is why not a tree, a fake tree? You know, we look at the, each application for aesthetics individually. Um, we ta always talk about this after we had our first tree application, which has not been constructed yet. Um, and I think it's sometimes it's the impact uh, against the cost of that aesthetic improvement. Our code doesn't say thou shall always install a tree. It just talks about the best uh, installation for aesthetics for the site. Um, we could go back and of course aesthetics are very subjective. Um, we could go back and look at some of the um, the photo simulations. I think in this case that uh, an artificial tree might look um, more clunky there. None of these trees are, mon are the, the, the Monterey Pines. The artificial Monterey Pines, they've, they're doing pretty well. Some of the deciduous trees they're trying to do, the palm trees are so-so. But to get these, these wispy, um, um, thin-leafed eucalyptus or what, whatever they are, um, that shape in an artificial monopine is next to impossible. So I think a big artificial Monterey pine plop there would probably look worse. Um, and then also we look at uh, the impacts to the neighborhood um, and a result of neighborhood outreach in the community meetings that they had and have not respond, had any responses from neighbors with concerns of aesthetics. So I think those so, are the two things that drove us to our 
recommendation with the monopole. My last question would be, would an artificial tree have an impact on additional antennas? If they were to potentially be co-localized on that, would an artificial tree have allow less space for additional antennas? You know, I don't know. I've seen some on 80 now that have, I think, three or four or not three, four or five stacked locations that they're getting tall, 80 and 100 and 120 feet. Those would be taller than we would allow. Yeah. Um, on this one, I think conceivably you could have another row of antenna. I think there's a five foot clearance, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, from the top of those panel antennas. So probably one more layer of antennas could go on there. Now whether at that point, I mean, that would be a new application. So we would yeah. give a benefit that it's a co-location, but we'd still be in front of you. I think, and say if there's an aesthetic impact that it would need to be mitigated. I, again, I don't think, I think at that point the antennas are going to be even lower in the tree line and probably um, the requirement to put in an um, artificial Monterey pine there would still, we'd still have the same impacts. It might look out of place. It might look larger and more dense and more clunky than the, the existing vegetation that's on site. And by that point, the antennas that are going to be on the monopole will be so much lower, they'll be even less noticeable from Crestview or Los Vientos or Best Court. So. Okay. But it would be an independent. It would be a. a it would be a whole new review. Thank that you. Came through. Commissioner Gibney. Thank you. I also add that if the original monopole foundation and steel itself is not designed for multiple antennas and engineered for that at the beginning, it's not going to really matter. You, you got to do that up front, so it doesn't look like this is for their internal SCADA system. They don't. They're not anticipating anyone else going up there. I, they can address this, I'm sure. Maybe they've had other folks express an interest in it. But, you know, that's, that's, that's their deal. Okay. And then the only other question I had was, and this has only to do with, we have two 36-inch uh, microwave dishes up there. And my question is specific. Uh, in condition number one, any changes determined to be significant may require additional review by the Planning Commission. If they were to add or find a need for a third dish, would that be viewed as significant? It could be, and that's a good question. Sometimes we at the planning counter encourage applicants to ask for more. So they could ask for three dishes or four dishes. We've seen this before in other applications, and then they have an entitlement for the four. They install two, and they're writing entitlement for two more um, is in the back pocket. And that's something that I think makes sense just from an efficiency standpoint for um, this commission and for staff and also for the applicant. Right, and that's, I see the applicant's coming up, so that's the straight man question. Thanks. Okay, I, shall we hear from the applicant then, please? Yeah, my name is Dave Hyatt, I'm with On Air, and I'm representing Calwater. I'd, uh, I'd like to start off just by thanking staff for their support and uh, help with this application. Also for you uh, as well for reviewing it. And my, my questions or my comments tonight are really focused around answering and addressing your questions. And you mentioned a uh, uh, question about the monopine. monopine. And uh, what Gavin said is actually correct. It would be considerably taller than the existing uh, support structure that we're proposing. Um, and they do, uh, I've seen a, a number of them, and they don't look that <laughs> attractive, actually. But in, in, in this case, what you don't see is also that uh, a, a, uh, the second tank that will be there, which will actually provide some additional coverage uh, to remove any of that aesthetic impact. And actually what you were saying as well uh, uh, regarding the structural uh, aspects of the, mono, of the pole itself are correct. They have to be designed specifically for the intended purpose, so they're purpose built and all of that has to be done up front. Not only just, not only the foundation, but the actual uh, pipe or pole itself. So, uh, and in terms of uh, additional capabilities, that's certainly something that uh, we would uh, 
consider. We have not uh, applied for that at this point, um, but uh, would certainly be open to doing that. Co-location as well, uh, that uh, is certainly an area that we're open to. Uh, th there is a, going to be that technical uh, distance limitation, minimum distance li limitations. Uh, and uh, predominantly the, the pole is uh, purposely designed for its in, uh, intended purpose or intended uh, targets in the surrounding San Mateo area. So the, the location for those antennas, the parabolas that we'll be using, uh, is very critical. So anything would have to be either below it or above it, and you probably don't want anything above it. So that'd be just extending it beyond that. So if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to. No. Questions? No? no? Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Any ready to anyone else? Is there anyone else who would like to to come up and speak about this item on the agenda? No? Seeing none? Move to close public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. How do you feel about being able to make the findings? Do you have any? I'm fine. Findings are made. Are concerned? Okay. Do we have a motion? I move that the Planning Commission approve the request of David Hyatt representing Calwater for a conditional use permit and architect architectural review approval to allow a new 60-foot tall monopole and two new microwave dish antennas at 700 Crestview Drive based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the staff report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, there's a 10-day right of appeal. Next item on the agenda, consideration of a resolution concerning minor amendments to Title 18 zoning of the San Carlos Municipal Code to implement the intent of the recently approved com comprehensive update of the zoning code. Staff report, please. Good evening, Commissioners. Lisa Costa Sanders, Principal Planner. Uh, the item before you this evening is some minor amendments to Title 18. And uh, as you know, we just recently completed a comprehensive update to the zoning code. And whenever you do that, you, you know, we're starting to look at implementing that zoning code. And we found a, a few items that, that need some tweaking. Um, so let me just walk through those with you briefly. Uh, the first item relates to um, exempting projects from the public noticing requirements that are more of a staff level design review items. The second is exempting fences and walls from obtaining um, zoning clearance review when they're within that stream development and maintenance areas. And then finally, removing the new hillside density reduction table that was added into um, Chapter 18.12 relating to the hillside overlay district. Uh, so regarding the, the public notice requirement, um, we were very interested in adding some design review requirements to all um, exterior projects. So that would include signage, um, exterior additions to single family residences. So formalizing that that is a design review process. I think when that happened, um, a section was inadvertently added or it may have been copied from another model ordinance by the consultant to then also require a public noticing process. Um, some of our concerns with that public noticing process is it would delay the timing in order to approve an application. Um, so right now we can approve something at a staff level in a relatively short period of time. This is going to add at least 10 to 15 days to give that public notice timeline. Um, the other item as of concern is that these are really you know, staff level ministerial approvals. And when you have a public noticing requirement, that neighbor that receives the notice now maybe has an expectation that they can influence the decision. Maybe we would deny it or make some changes. So I think our concern is the ability then um, and the expectation that would be out there with the residents. We currently do um, a courtesy notice for all second story additions to make sure we're able to 
incorporate any input the neighbors have on that. We would continue to do that. And this also would not change any of the noticing requirements we currently have in place for the RDRC review items and for the Planning Commission items. It's just the very minor staff level review items. Uh, and then the next item is that when we updated the stream development and maintenance um, overlay ordinance, it contains a much more detailed description of what is allowed and not allowed within that 20-foot setback corridor um, from the streamline. And it does prohibit, as we interpret it, the construction of fences or walls. Now, a lot of these creeks are located in, within people's rear yards, and so we want to allow the ability to construct a fence or a wall, so long as it doesn't require a building permit. Um, and so we would recommend uh, allowing the fences and walls to be allowed within that creek setback area. And then the hillside density reduction table, um, it actually ends up being less restrictive than our current subdivision ordinance. So currently our subdivision ordinance does have a standard based on the slope of the lot, how, what the minimum size would be for any new subdivision. And this actually um, was more generous. So you could, with this table, have a smaller lot than the current subdivision ordinance. So our proposal is then to remove that table and to continue to rely on the slope density requirement we have in our subdivision ordinance that establishes the minimum for any new lot divisions. Uh, so staff does recommend that the commission adopt the resolution, and this is a recommendation to the city council to adopt those minor amendments to Title 18 to implement the intent of the approved comprehensive update to the zoning code. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Okay, who wants to start off with questions? No questions? It's kind of controversial. No, I'm good. You're good? <laughs> Commissioner Marsters? Only one question. Um, so it's actually on the um, second item, which is the... Um, fences and walls. The fences and walls. Is there currently um, any, um, so your proposal is to really have uh, um, um, the fences and walls that are built um, not require a building permit. Is there any distance from the edge of the creek bank that is a requirement for those fences and walls? Um, there would not be in the zoning code. Gavin, do you know if there's anything? So they could actually be at yeah. the top of the creek bank? Right. They could not be in the creek they bank. They could not be in the creek bank, but they could be right at the top of the creek mm -hmm. bank. Okay. Were you finished? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Yeah, I have a quick question. Then. Go ahead. Just in honor of Mr. Marster's quick question regarding the uh, actual wording on the motion, it seems uh, a bit awkward. I don't want to have to make you speak, uh, Mr. Rubens, but maybe you could address that. giving more specifically aren't we just giving a recommendation that the city adopt I I think the um, the resolution makes the recommendation so I, if, if that's the point you're making the resolution itself has in the title it's a it's a recommendation okay so that's okay all right that makes more sense no no it's, it's, it's just Commissioner Marsters did I, I don't know if that this is the appropriate place, but I I was just a little worried about having the fences right up at the creek bank, um, oh, top of creek, the top of the creek bank, and and whether there there needs to be some sort of uh, I mean every at every other everything that I've been through with a creek bank, right. we always have 
you know, a couple of feet or five feet or something away from the creek bank, and I just this sort of tells me that there's you can you can build the fence right at the creek bank, and that bothers me a little bit. Um, so I I don't know if this is the appropriate time to talk about that or or not. I I don't have a problem with um, making the the fences and walls not require a building permit, but um, the the fact that there is no setback from the creek bank, even a couple of feet. Yeah, and I think from a practical standpoint, most fences are set in a few feet. Um, obviously, in constructing it, you need to put in some kind of a, a footing to hold the post, and um, you know they need access and work to it. Uh, we do need to make sure that they they don't undermine the creek, they don't alter the stream bed in any way. Uh, so, from a practical standpoint, they're typically uh, set in a few feet from the edge of the creek bank. Okay. Well, perhaps your question but, goes to the enforcement of that, though, right? I mean, how are you going to know? If it doesn't require a building permit, the city's not going to be involved. Is that the fair to part of it is trying to figure, you know. Yeah. Um, we do get a lot of calls. A lot of the property owners along the creek bank are, have been pretty well educated recently because we've done a lot of cleanups, and you know, we've really been out there to do a lot of education with, that, with those property owners. So they're, they're pretty good about contacting staff and even having one of somebody from our engineering department actually walk out there and take a look at it. Um, so my experience is they've been really good about contacting staff. And since they're walking the creek so often to make sure there's no obstructions, they would notice if there's any new construction too close that would impact the creek, and then they could then work with the property owner to modify that. OK. I, I just see that question as whether you want an identifiable standard or you want to rely on um, the practical considerations that someone building a fence would know you don't want to put it right up against the bank where it's going to be in danger of falling or, or being undermined. Right. Okay. So what's the conclusion of that? Well, let, let's do that you, during discussion. I oh, think okay. There may be people that I still want to, given the public hearing still open. Maybe, maybe I could just clarify that we've historically allowed fences to be located as such, you know, close to the edge of the creek right. bank. So this is um, kind of going back to how we've been implementing the code for several years. But but with the added benefit of having a number of years of education regarding that area and how mm -hmm. sensitive it is. Okay. So is there anyone here who would like to comment uh, during the public hearing portion of this item? Seeing <laughs> none. All right, move to close the public hearing section. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 If I may, Madam Chair? Yes, please. I can make the findings. I can make the findings. You can make the findings, okay. Well, I can make the findings. I would, I would like to, on um, Exhibit A, Item number four, the bottom of the page. I think that's section 18.14.030 for the hillside because the, that section 18.12 is, or not the hillside, for the, for the, the, stream, the stream side versus the hillside is 18.14. And then the hillside is 18.12. I'm working off of a draft version of the ordinance, so who knows? Maybe someone went and changed all the numbers. But I have this that the SDM overlay district is in section 18.14, and the hillside overlay district is section 18.12. Look at that and um, okay, just, just, yeah, just make sure that the, the, the section numbers are correct, and I'm just taking. A quick look to see if I have any other questions noted here. So, and so going back to that that exact same item number four. So, what we're adding to the end of it is fence is not subject to the issuance of a building permit. 
shall be allowed. Clearly implied in that is that fences that do require a building permit would also be allowed, right? I, I just found it funny that it said that if they're not subject to a, a permit, they would be allowed. But if they are subject to a permit, wouldn't they also be allowed? So like the special situations that we have, that we have um, listed in that section that's referred to 18.14, it lists a whole bunch of special situations where you would have to get a permit, which would be like a 12-foot high chain link fence and... See where that page is. Which wouldn't be allowed along of Creek Bank anyway. Well, I what a okay, so for a recreation area fence, fences shall not exceed 12 feet and high may be located around tennis courts, badminton courts, basketball or volleyball courts. I could certainly see someone yeah, having yeah. that at the back of their of their property. Yeah. So I just I just wanted to make sure that we weren't inadvertently excluding the ability to build these other types of swimming pool fences and security fences that apparently would require permits. Yeah, I'd like to um, confirm with the staff member that did the research and prepared the staff report, but it, it seems through the discussion uh, we don't need that reference to a building permit. Just okay, so I would just allowed. request staff to take a look at that. Thank you just so it doesn't create any problems for us down down the pike. Yeah. Okay, those those are my only comments and and subject to those being reviewed then I am also can make the findings. So are we are we ready for the motion? No. Ask Mr. Marsters. Mr. Marsters, are we ready to make the motion? Yes. You want me to make it? Okay. The ball is in your court. I move that the Planning Commission adopt res <coughs> resolution. I move that the Planning Commission adopt resolution number 2012-01, recommending that the City Council adopt amendments to the Title 18 zoning of the San Carlos Municipal Code based on the findings incorporated in the resolution of the Planning Commission and for the reasons stated in the staff report with the added um, condition of allowing staff to um, work on the wording of the um, fencing. Is that? Um. You want me I to think find that a reference to building permit in there. So yes. what we'll do is we'll we'll correct, correct the correct grammar. Of, okay. We also need to correct the section number. We'll if that with the correction with the there we go with staff looking at verifying the uh, section number. I'll second that. <laughs> Good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I guess there's a 10-day right of appeal on that also? Yes. No, 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 no because it has to pass. It has to go to the Take that back. city council. Then. Okay, um, reports, correspondence, and general information. Report on recent city council actions. Thank you. At the last city council meeting, the council um, adopted a resolution to form the Old County Road Underground District. So um, this helps us implement the um, Eastside Connect project. So we'll be working with uh, PG&E as well as our designer to get through. It's quite a long process actually to design and um, do the joint trenching and actually underground the utilities. Mm -hmm. But we've moving forward on the first step of that. Um, and then the council also had some discussion and passed some resolutions on the um, dissolution of the redevelopment agency um, due to the recent decision on the lawsuit. And if you have any questions on that, our city attorney could probably best answer them. Um, but we don't really have kind of that full impact um, determined at this point. And that's I, all I, I would, have. I, yeah, that. I would like to to have everyone on the commission be able to hear more about that at a late, later meeting when everyone is present, whenever it would be appropriate to put on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Be glad Sorry, to do didn't it. mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to make sure we didn't nice. lose it. Anything else from City Council? Okay. Um, any comments or 
reports from the commission members? Yeah, if I may, do, do we have any um, action items we could give the absentee uh, commissioners? Maybe a new subcommittee to, uh, or liaison activity? I, I thought we could uh, a couple. Yeah. Could they be in charge of refreshments for the next meeting? Ooh. When we have transportation and circulation here so that we can welcome that. You're that the chair. Session. It's going to be a short night. <laughs> okay, so. We'll, we'll leave that right. for a future agenda item yes. as well. All right, very good. Okay, any correspondence? Covering the bases. No mm -hmm. correspondence. No, thank you. Okay, any other comments, reports, updates, current projects from planning staff? I just wanted to remind you that your next meeting is Wednesday, January 25th, and as indicated, we have a joint study session with the Traffic and Circulation Commission on the Wheeler Environmental Impact Report. And again, we're not sure how that project's going to proceed, but we've completed the EIR, and it does make sense to move forward with the Environmental Impact Report. Um, that's a longer-term entitlement anyway, and then we'll kind of evaluate after that if we move forward with the project components. Um, also on that same hearing would be the continuance of the um, Carlos Club item. So that'll be on that agenda as well. I have a question regarding projects. Yeah. That, that's why I said it was going to be a short night. Uh, for staff, what is the latest on, if anything, the transit village? Yeah, I don't. I don't have an update. We can provide that at your next meeting. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. Uh, question about the meeting next time: Is the Wheeler Plaza going to be the first item on the agenda, or is it going to be the? Uh, yes, we'd like to structure it so that the Wheeler Plaza is the first item on the agenda. We'd also like to take the um, traffic and the parking item first in your discussion and then the traffic and circulation committee con commission can adjourn to their meeting and then you can talk about the other environmental items okay uh, so that's how we'd like to structure it and then once you're completed with that you can move into the public hearing on the the carlos club item okay so is there a way to help that applicant for 612 el camino manage what i'm sure will be an active participating audience as far as timing goes yeah well i uh, we haven't staff. We haven't really discussed it, but it seems that we might be able to break it up and do a special meeting and a, and a continuation of this meeting for the because you, you really are just continuing right. your regular meeting to the twenty fifth for the Carlos Club item, mm -hmm. and we could perhaps specially agendize a time, a dedicated time for the other one, and just call it a special meeting. We'll have to publish two yeah. agendas. We'll work on that. Yeah, I think that would make more sense. Yeah. Okay. If there's anything else, last countdown. Okay. This meeting is adjourned. Fantastic.